Calvary Church is dedicated to doctrine, and we want you to experience the life change that comes from knowing God's Word and applying it to your life. So we explain the Bible verse by verse, every chapter, every book. This is Expound. If you are new to Wednesday nights, this is a baptism by fire uh, tonight. Uh, we are, last week and the week before, we covered two chapters uh, each night. I'm just letting that sink in a little bit for people who come here frequently. That's sort of a milestone. Um, it's funny that for me, uh, as the older I get and the more I go through this book, uh, I almost feel the need to slow down because I just see things and get more out of it. Uh, the more and more you go through it, you, you might tend to think, well, it would be the opposite. You've gone through it before, and I'll just kind of hurry up. But um, yeah, I find it's not that way. But that, n nonetheless, uh, we, want, we do want to get through these chapters. I don't want to belabor. These names are difficult, and that's why I applaud you for coming out again. Uh, i got to hand it to you. You just are, are sticking with it, and uh, we're making it through the Scripture together. I'll tell you again why I think this is important. If you start reading the New Testament like I did when I first got saved, I started reading the first book in the New Testament, the Gospel of Matthew. But I kept noticing that Matthew would say, as it is written, and then he'd give a quote, as the prophet said, and he'd give a quote, as it is written. He did that frequently. So after a while, I just got curious. Well, he keeps quoting what is written, where is it written, and in what context was it written? So I then began to realize that for Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul, all the New Testament people, their Bible was the Old Testament. So it does behoove the Christian to have a working knowledge of all of the scripture. It's not too daunting a task. I wrote a book called The Bible from 30,000 Feet. I wrote another book on how to study your Bible and enjoy it. I'm committed to the process, and I'm glad you are as well. Uh, we are in chapter 15 of 2 Kings. You will need a Bible to follow along, or it just gets insane. If you're not following along in the script, it gets insane. So if you didn't bring a Bible, the person next to you is probably a nice person. I can't guarantee that. <laughs> but they might allow you to look over their shoulder and, and share. Uh, or there are Bibles. Are there still Bibles in the chairs? Yeah. They're still there? OK. So sometimes they, they walk off. But um, if there's one there, you could grab one and turn to the Old Testament book of 2 Kings. And we're going to begin in chapter 15, and I'm not going to promise you anything more. But did you know that originally 1 Kings and 2 Kings was one book, just called the Kings? Until about the first century BC, then it was divided into two separate documents, 1 and 2 Kings as we know it. It was actually a part of a four-book piece known as 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 3 Kings, and 4 Kings. So 1 Samuel was first the first book of the kingdoms, 2 Samuel, the second book of the kingdoms, 1 Kings, the third book of the kingdoms, 2 Kings, the fourth book of the kingdoms. That's how it was laid out. Because we are dealing with kings, good ones, bad ones, kingdoms, the kingdom of Israel, the 12 tribes of Israel have split. In 930 BC, there's 10 up north, there's two down south. The ones up north, how many, how many good kings did they have up north? Zero. Zero. Zip. Zilch. Nada. Nicht. Nothing at all. Uh, whereas down south, they had eight good kings. So they had more good kings. Well, obviously, one good king would be more than the north. But uh, they had 
Um, I wouldn't say an even number, but they had almost as many good kings as bad kings, and we're going to read about many bad ones and uh, a couple of good ones uh, here tonight. Who wrote this book? We're not sure. Tradition says Jeremiah the prophet wrote First and Second Kings. That's the tradition. That's the Jewish tradition. And one of their reasonings is that Jeremiah not only foretold the fall of the kingdom of Israel and Judah, but he was there when it happened. When Jerusalem was surrounded by Babylonians and it fell and was burned, he saw it. He recorded what it was like in poetic language in a book called Lamentations as he lamented over the fall of that city, also another Old Testament book. As we're jumping in, a reminder, since we're going to go north-south, north-south, bouncing back and forth between the northern kingdom of Israel, which has how many tribes? Ten. And the southern kingdom of Judah, which has two tribes. See, you guys are on it. You are on it. You know more than the average bear. Um, I, I liken the book of 2 Kings, it's like watching The Voice or watching American Idol or watching America has got talent or um, The X Factor, watching one of these competitions where you have a, a few outstanding performers but lots of bad ones. That's what the book of Kings is like. Although we're not dealing with singers, we're dealing with sovereigns, with kings. You have a few standout ones in the, even the list of good ones. Some of them are good, but some are better than others in that good list. But then you have many out-of-tune sovereigns, bad voices, bad performers from the get-go. So in the 27th year, verse 15, uh, first one of chapter 15, in the 27th year of King Jeroboam, the king of Israel. Again, this is Jeroboam II of Israel, the northern ten tribes. Azariah, the son of Amaziah, the king of Judah, became king. Now I told you last week, I need to remind you, Azariah goes by another name, and that is Uzziah. Uzziah. We get to the book of Isaiah. He uses the name Uzziah. Uzziah is the throne name of this king uh, named Azariah here in verse 1. Same guy. He reigns for 52 years. He has the longest reign of any of the kings down south except for one, uh, Manasseh will have a 55-year reign, but this guy has a pretty good run at it, 52-year tenure as the king down south. Uzziah, Azariah, same guy, was a good king, was a successful monarch, brought security to the nation, brought economic development to the nation, expanded the borders of Judah, strengthened the borders of Judah. He was excellent in what he did militarily, economically, as a monarch. Verse 2, he was 16 years old when he became king, and he reigned 52 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jechaliah of Jerusalem, and he did what was right in the sight of the Lord. Every time I read that, I want to just shout hallelujah, because it's sort of rare. He did what was right in the sight of the Lord according to all that his father Amaziah had done, except. It's not a good word to read when you're talking about a person's good side. Oh, he's awesome, she's awesome, but except. And here's the downside, that the high places were not removed. Now, we've talked about this, so I don't want to keep going over it. You know what they were, and you know that this was a habit these kings just sort of let things ride, and this guy just sort of lets these things go on. These high places where God was worshipped, but in a convenient manner, not in a prescribed manner, remember. So he didn't remove the high places. They were not removed. The people still sacrificed and burned incense on the high places. So get the picture. In Jerusalem, there was a temple. 
The temple had been built by Solomon. It was a grand edifice. The people were commanded, that's the place God wants to be worshipped. That's the place you bring the sacrifices. God said, one city, one place. That's it. But as time went on, they wanted the convenience of worshiping God in their own neighborhood, not driving as far. There's a high place right around the corner here. They have a nice coffee shop. We're just going to go there. So they bypassed the commandment of God, sought to worship God conveniently. This guy sort of continues the practice of that. So his first flaw is lenience, which is a flaw of some of these kings, many of them. They just sort of let things ride. They don't want to... They don't want to upset the apple cart. They don't want to get too radical in the reforms of worshiping God. So he, he just let it go. Lenience. Then, verse 5 is an interesting verse. Then the Lord struck the king so that he was a leper until the day of his death. And so he dwelt in an isolated house. Lepers had to do that. And Jotham, the king's son, was over the royal house, judging the people of the land. You you read this and you go, now what's up with that? Here it says he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, and God struck the poor guy with leprosy. Well, you need the rest of the story, I think. His first flaw was license, or lenience. His second flaw was license. He did something. He crossed a line. He performed an action that invited the judgment of God upon his life. You don't get it in this story. That's why at the end of many of these paragraphs it says, and isn't this written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah? And we always say, yes, it is. But we have to wait till we get to Chronicles to read that. So since it's going to be a while until we get to Chronicles, In 2 Chronicles chapter 26, you could turn there very easily just by making a right-hand turn going down a couple blocks. 2 Chronicles chapter 26, we get the reason why this happened. Verse 16 of chapter 26 of 2 Chronicles. But when he, that is King Uzziah, King Azariah, same guy, when he was strong... His heart was lifted up to his destruction. He got so prideful, lifted up, hubris, so prideful that he was on a self-destructive path. His heart was lifted up to his destruction for he transgressed against the Lord his God by entering the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. He intruded into the priest's office and started acting like he was of the house of Aaron. Only the house of Aaron could occupy the office of a priest. So he thinks, I'm king. I've been around a long time. I've served a long time. I've been very successful. I've been doing what is right in the sight of the Lord. I've always thought it would be cool to be a priest. So he, he burned incense. Not The fact wasn't that he just burned incense. He did it on the altar of incense. In the holy place of the temple itself where only the priest can go. So Azariah, the priest, went after him. And with him were 80 priests of the Lord who were valiant men. They're going to take this guy down if need be. And they withstood King Uzziah and said to him, It is not for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to the Lord, but for the priests, the sons of Aaron, who are consecrated to burn incense. Get out of the sanctuary, for you have trespassed, for you have no honor. You shall have no honor from the Lord God. Then Uzziah became furious. How dare you speak to me? Don't you know who I am? I'm the king. I'm your king. And he had a censer in his hand. Again, that's something only the priest could hold. He had a censer in his hand to burn incense. And while he was angry with the priest, leprosy broke out on his forehead before the priests in the house of the Lord beside the incense altar. And Azariah, the chief priest, and all the priests looked at him 
And there on his forehead he was leprous, so they thrust him out of that place. Indeed, he also hurried to get out because the Lord had struck him. King Uzziah was a leper until the day of his death. He dwelt in an isolated house because he was a leper, for he was cut off from the house of the Lord. Then Jotham, his son, was over the king's house, judging the people of the land. Aren't you glad you read that? Now you have the full story. Now you understand why. Josephus, the Jewish historian, writes about this in his history of the Jewish nation, saying that when King Uzziah went into the temple, an earthquake broke out in Jerusalem. And people knew it was the judgment of God because this man was trying to act like a priest. Now, he's not the first king to do this. There was another king who acted like a priest. Anybody know his name? King Saul. Very good. So King Saul was told by the prophet Samuel to wait seven days after this battle with the Philistines. So he waited a week, waited seven days. Samuel didn't show up. And so Saul offered a sacrifice like a priest would do. Samuel, the prophet, came along and said, what on earth are you doing? And Saul said, well, we waited for you. You didn't show up. And then he said, and besides that, I just felt compelled to. You know, I just sort of, this is, this is on my heart to do. I don't care if it's on your heart to do. It's not in the word to do. And so that began Saul's downfall. And that is the first time that the prophet indicated God has rejected you from being the king over this nation. He's going to replace you now. Because his heart is starting to be revealed and it got revealed more and more. But that's the first time like Uzziah, or I should say Uzziah, was like King Saul. So, one king down. Now the rest of the Acts... Uh, chapter 15, 2 Kings, verse 6, the rest of the acts of Azariah and all that he did. Are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Judah? To which you answer, yes. And you have read that account. So Azariah rested with his fathers. King Uzziah rested with his fathers. Now what does that mean when it says rested with his fathers? He died. It's a nice way of saying he kicked the bucket. He died. He croaked. He carked it. And they buried him with his fathers in the city of David, and Jotham, his son, reigned, uh, reigned in his place. Now, when King Uzziah died, a prophet got a vision. That's exactly how Isaiah chapter 6 begins. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. Seated on a throne, high and lifted up, the train of his robe filled the temple. And he got a call from the Lord. And Isaiah began to prophesy during the reign of four different kings, including King Uzziah. It was in that final year of his death after reigning 52 years. And the people wondering, oh, he was a good king and now he's dead. What's going to become of the nation? We don't have a king on the throne who was as good as he was. And Probably Isaiah the prophet felt the same way. Who's going to be on the throne? God said, I'm still on the throne. And he gave him a vision that no matter who's on the earthly throne, and we should remember, no matter who's in the White House, remember God's on the throne of his house. He is high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And so in the worst times, God calls his servants. Now verse 8, in the thirty eighth year of Azariah. Now we have a whole slew of bad kings. And this reads like a, a political playbook from ancient times where one guy becomes king and he was a bad dude and there, somebody conspired against him and killed him and on it goes. So in the 38th year of Azariah, the king of Judah, Zechariah, the son of Jeroboam II, reigned over Israel in Samaria six months. So we're back up north. He did evil in the sight of the Lord, as his fathers had done. Did not depart from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel sin. Then Shalom, the son of Jabesh, conspired against him 
and struck him and killed him in front of the people and he reigned in his place. When I read Shalom, I think of Gollum, right? Remember Lord of the Rings? My precious. I think about it. But, but I, I can't let my mind go there. It's Shalom, a whole different character and a, and a real historical character. So he conspired against him and killed him, and he reigned in his place. The rest of the acts of Zechariah, indeed, this is not Zechariah the prophet, by the way, different Zechariah. Are they written in the chronicles of the kings of Israel? To which we answer, yes. well, we, it, it, they are, but we don't have the chronicles of the kings of Israel, do we? We only have the chronicles of the kings of Judah, and we told you why last week. None of the kings up north in Israel are worth mentioning because they were all bad. They're not even worth remembering, so there's no record of them. But there were some good kings in Judah, and God said, I'm going to preserve that heritage, even though there were some bad ones as well. There were eight good ones, so we have the chronicles of the kings of Judah. They're worth looking at. The ones up north, not a single one was worth noticing. The rest of the Zechariah are they? Yeah, but this uh, verse twelve. This was the word of the Lord which he spoke to Jehu, saying, "Your sons shall sit on the throne of Israel to the fourth generation." And so it was. So the house of Jehu. We, we read about him the last few weeks. Jehu is over. God said to Jehu, because you were faithful in being my instrument of judgment on the house of Ahab, I'm going to preserve your kingdom for four generations. Four generations are up. Now the house of Jehu, the posterity of Jehu is over. So Shalom, the conspirator, the guy who killed the king is sitting on the throne. Verse 13, Shalom the king, the son of Jabesh became king in the 39th year of Uzziah. Uzziah, again, there's the name of, the throne name of the king Azariah, the king of Judah. And he reigned, you know, look how long Shalom reigned, a full month. Didn't just say a month, but a whole month. Maybe with a wink, maybe with a like, ooh, wow. You know, the mighty reign of the king, one month. I mean, it's, he, he hardly, you know, got his throne uh, robes on right and his crown adjusted. And after a month, he was killed. Although Tom Petty did say it's good to be king if just for a while. And so maybe he would sing that song. But after a month, he's dead. For, here's another conspirator. Menahem, the son of Gadi, went up from Tirzah, came to Samaria, and struck Shalom. So he got it right back at him. The son of Jabesh in Samaria killed him, and he reigned in his place. The rest of the acts of Shalom, the conspiracy which he led, they're written about in the chronicles of the kings of Israel. Then from Tirzah, Menahem attacked Tifsah and all who were there and its territory because they did not open it to him. Therefore, he attacked it. And all the women there who were with child, he ripped open. Yeah, it's one of those verses of scripture that should elicit that kind of a response. Here you have a king of Israel acting with the same brutality of one of the Assyrian monarchs. I'll tell you a little bit about the Assyrian monarchs, but they were known, well known, for their brutality, killing people, killing pregnant women, uh, and, and ripping them open while they were with child, the, the kind of atrocities. So this king did this. Now, a word about Menahem. We believe that Menahem, if you're interested, FYI, was the commander of the army of Israel. And we've seen this before, did we not, with King Ben-Hadad of Syria? His commander, Hazael, killed him with a towel, suffocated him. So here's a commander close to power, wanting all of the power. Uh, he was uh, the commander of Jeroboam II and then the commander of this guy. So he thought, I could do a better job. Killed him, sat on the throne, and he was a brutal, brutal monarch. In the 39th year, verse 17 of Azariah, king of Judah, same as Uzziah, 
Menahem, the son of Gadi, became king over Israel, reigned ten years in Samaria. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord, did not depart all his days from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel sin. So watch this. Pool, king of Assyria, came against the land, and Menahem gave Pool a thousand talents of silver, that his hand might be with him to strengthen the kingdom in his hand. And Menahem exacted all the money from Israel, from all the very wealthy, for each man 50 shekels of silver to give to the king of Assyria. So the king of Assyria turned back and did not stay there in the land. Now, this is an important set of verses. This happens to be the very first mention of the Assyrian Empire. And they will become the world governing empire. They will control that region before Babylon takes them over. The Assyrian Empire came on the scene with great brutality. They took over people, butchering them in their path. They were so vicious that most people knew about their vicious approach and would just surrender without a fight because they knew, don't mess with these guys because they're they're horrible. If, If you become a prisoner, they'll treat you horribly. Now, a word about this guy named Pool, P U L. The full name is Tiglath. Pileser the third. You might have that in the margin of your Bible. Tiglath dash Pileser the third. His throne name was Pool. His official name was Tiglath Pileser the third. History records his incorrigible brutality. He figured out a way to skin men alive and yet keep them alive for a period of time so that he could exact the utmost suffering out of them. tiglath Pileser III, or Pull, also figured out a way to take his prisoners and take a sharp stick and thrust it through a person's rear, through the body and out the mouth, so that he was suspended on a pole like a shish kebab chicken and would die that kind of a death upright with a pole. He also would cut off the eyelids of his victims and place them out in the sun, forcing them to look at the sun until they were blind. The Ninevites were so utterly cruel that In 722 B.C., they will come in and swoop down and take the ten northern tribes captive. They're going into captivity, as the prophets have said. If you turn against God, he's going to allow you to suffer all the atrocities of the people around you who want to kill you, and you'll go into captivity. And they did. The ten northern tribes in 722 B.C. will be taken captive by the Assyrians There was a prophet that God sent to the capital of the Assyrian nation. His name was Jonah. And he said, Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh. That's the capital of Assyria. And I want you to proclaim judgment to them. Well, Jonah didn't want to go because he hated them. They were enemies of his people. They came and they committed these kind of atrocities. He didn't want to go to them. Even though it was a message of judgment, yet 40 days and Nineveh will be destroyed. You think of if you hate people and you want them judged, you would, you'd say, I'll sign up for that. I'll preach hellfire and brimstone on the Ninevites. Sign me up. But Jonah didn't want to go because he knew how merciful God was. And he thought, well, what if I preach to them and it works? What if I preach to them and I'm successful? And the people actually repent and turn, then God's going to forgive them. I know he's so merciful. I don't like that about God. He's merciful on the people I'd rather kill. And so Jonah eventually, God got his attention. He was down in the mouth, and he finally... I'm waiting for that to catch up. After a few days out in the ocean, he goes, I see. 
And, <laughs> and he went. And he preached. And it worked. And they dressed the Ninevites in sackcloth and ashes and repented. And God spared the city from judgment. And Jonah sat outside under a little gourd plant and just pouted. I knew it, God. I know you're so kind to people and so merciful. You have had to forgive them, didn't you? The pouting prophet. So now the first mention of Assyria, and they'll be mentioned again. The rest of the acts of Menahem and all that he did are they not written in the chronicles of the kings of Israel. Menahem wrestled with his fathers and Pekahiah. See, these names are brutal, aren't they? You'll never remember them. I never do. Pekahiah, his son, reigned in his place. In the 50th year of Azariah, also known as Uzziah, king of Judah, Pekahiah, the son of Menahem, became king over Israel in Samaria and reigned for two years. He did evil in the sight of the Lord, did not depart from the sins of Jeroboam, sons of Nebat, who made Israel sin. Pekah, the son of Remaliah, Pekah, the son of Remaliah, an officer of his, conspired against him and killed him in Samaria. So you get these guys on the throne, other people conspire against them, take their lives, and it's crazy up there. Killed him in Samaria in the citadel of the king's house, along with Argob. If you ever name your son Argob, I may not want to dedicate that child. That's just one Bible name you want to stay away from. Are we clear? Argob. Don't do that. And Arie. Now, that's a good name. That in Hebrew means lion. Right, Matt? Arie, Lion. Matt and I are taking Hebrew class together. So, so that's a good name. You can name your son Arie. That's a good name, Lion. And with him were 50 men of Gilead. He killed him and reigned in his place. Now the rest of his, the acts of Pekahiah and all that he did, indeed they are written in the book of the Chronicles of the King of Israel. In the 52nd year of Azariah, the king of Judah, also known as Uzziah, Pekah, the son of Remaliah, became king over Israel in Samaria and reigned 20 years. He did evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not depart from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel sin. In the days of Pekah, the king of Israel, tiglath Pileser, that's also known as Pul, right? We just read that. The king of Assyria came and took Ijon, Abel, Beth Ma'akah, Genoa, Kadesh, Hatsor, Gilead, and Galilee, all the land of Naphtali. This is an area up north that if you're with us, if you've been with us when we go to Israel, there's that day when we go to the northern part up by Tel Dan and that green area up by Mount Hermon, that whole area in the north, even by Hazor and all these cities. That's the area that we're talking about that he took. He carried them captive to Assyri Assyria. Okay, I have to explain that. I mentioned that the Assyrians were brutal. I gave you a few anecdotes about how they were brutal. When they took prisoners captive, when it says they were carried captive to Assyria, here was their practice. They took a hook and they would put it into the nose or into the lip or into the jaw. A rope would be strung from that hook to the next prisoner, a hook in that prisoner's jaw, and so you have a line like hooked fish in a line, and then they would march them by foot from their hometown toward Assyria. A, a brutal monarchy. So when it says, carried them captive to Assyria, that's what's going on. Then Hosea, the son of Elah, led a conspiracy against Pekah, the son of Remaliah, struck and killed him. So he reigned in his place in the 20th year of Jotham, the son of Uzziah. Now the rest of the acts of Pekah, all that he did, indeed, they're written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel. In the second year of Pekah, the son of Remaliah, the king of Israel, Jotham, now we're back down south, the son of Uzziah, 
king of Judah reigned, began to reign. He was 25 years old when he became king. And he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jerusha, the daughter of Zadok. Zadok was a high priest. So she came from good stock. And he did what was right. <sighs> Feels so good to read that. He did what was right in the sight of the Lord. He did according to all that his father Uzziah had done. However, there's that except again. However, the high places were not removed. Nobody wants to touch those high places. Well, somebody will. The people still sacrificed and burned incense on the high places. He built the upper gate, or as it says in the old King James, the high gate, the higher gate of the house of the Lord. Now, the higher gate or the upper gate was a gate on the north side of the temple complex that connected the inner court of the temple with the outer court of the temple on the north side going up, ascending on Mount Moriah, on Zion. It was also called the New Gate. It was also called the North Gate. It was also called the Benjamin Gate. It was also called the Altar Gate in different places in the scripture. So this guy is all about the higher gate. He should have been worried about the high places and tore them down, not just build the high gate, the upper gate. But he was, comparatively speaking, good. Now the rest of the acts of Jotham, all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? Yes, and we'll get to it, God willing, someday. The Lord may come back by then at this pace. But In those days, the Lord began to send resin the king of Syria. Now, please notice there's a difference between Syria and Assyria. Syria is like directly north of Israel, still is to this day. It included back then Lebanon and Syria. Assyria included, yes, parts of Syria, but they were further north and east and encompassed more land. So this is Rezin, the king of Syria. Was I in verse 37? Okay. Halfway through the verse, so I should at least finish it out so you, don't, you won't say, he doesn't read all the Bible. In those days, the Lord began to send Rezin, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, against Judah. So, Jotham kicked the bucket, rested with his fathers. He was buried with his fathers in the city of David. His father, that is his ancestor. Then Ahaz, his son, reigned in his place. So we have a couple good kings down south, right? They're doing good. Well, hold that thought. In the 17th year of Pekah, Pekah's the northern king, king of the 10 tribes up north. In the 17th year, so that's 735 BC. This is 13 years before 722. 13 years before, in 13 years, they're all going to be gone. They're all going to be taken captive to Assyria. So in the 17th year of Pekah, the son of Remaliah, Ahaz, the son of Jotham, king of Judah, began to reign. Ahaz was 20 years old when he became king, and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem, and he did not do what was right in the sight of the Lord his God, as his father David had done. You might read this and be puzzled. How can you have a godly dad and a godly grandfather and yet end up like this? Don't godly parents beget godly children? Sometimes they do. Sometimes, however, I've seen it over and over again. You have godly, engaged, loving, accepting parents. But children grow up, are independent, make their own choices, and often rebel against the righteousness of a parent, the righteous standing of a parent. My parents were so 
narrow-minded, these crazy evangelical Christians making me go to church and abusing me spiritually, and they'll turn away from that. So you can have good godly examples, and yet sometimes the kids turn out great, sometimes they don't, because after all, we are free moral agents, we make our own choices, and this kid did, and it wasn't a good choice. So he didn't do what was right in the eyes of of the Lord his God, as his father David had done. Even though his dad was Jotham, even though his grandpa was Uzziah, little Ahaz uh, turned out to be a bad egg. Want to see how bad? Yeah, I know you did. Okay. Um, Verse 3, he walked in the way of the kings of Israel. Now, he's not in Israel, he's in Judah. But he's walking in the ways of the kings of Israel. How many kings in Israel were good? Zero. Zero. So this is like the worst thing you can say about a dude. Dude, you are walking in the ways of the kings of Israel. That's like like an insult. But he did. He walked in the ways of the kings of Israel. Indeed, or not just that, indeed, he made his son pass through the fire according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord had cast out from before the children of Israel. You know what that means? Sacrifice his son. Killed his son in a sacrificial ritual to a pagan god. What was the pagan god? His name was Molech. Molech was the god of the Moabites and Edomites. Uh, He was represented by... uh, usually a a little bull, a little bronze or brass bull uh, with a hollowed out stomach where they could put wood and coals inside and light a fire. The arms of this creature were outstretched like this. They would kindle the fire in this belly and heat up the, the metal and the arms became red hot. And once the, the, the arms became red hot, the baby was placed on that altar and burned to death. They did it in Jerusalem, and they did it at a place that's very, unfortunately, renowned for this. There's two valleys that meet in Jerusalem. You can go there and see where they meet. Uh, The Valley of Kidron meets the Valley of Gehenna, or Hinnom. And right where they meet, it was an area called Tophet. And Tophet became the place where Molech was worshipped and children were sacrificed to Molech placed there. The belief was if you place a baby in the arms of Molech and he dies, there will be a blessing extended, a freedom and a prosperity that will go to your future children and your family because of that. Now, the word tophet means drum or drumming because When the sacrifices were being made, loud drums were brought in and pounded to drown out the cries of the babies. So as the drums were going and the cymbals were playing, you couldn't hear the babies screaming on the red-hot arms of Molech. So here's a king in Judah, the son and grandson of godly parents, grandparents, who gets so bad that he follows the practices of the northern ten tribes, and of the the pagans over across the Jordan River. Sacrifices a baby. So, in killing the baby, you know, I'll get prosperity and freedom and blessing in my family. Very similar today. Children are burned with saline solution in the wombs of mothers. Because the belief is, I have my freedom now. I'll have the ability to do what I want to do and have a blessing to do this. I've heard ladies say, it was a blessing for me to do this. And then it is placed cleverly under reproductive freedom. So this king sunk to a whole new low. Back in these days, it was an abomination, according to the Lord. And he sacrificed and burned incense, verse 4, on the high places, on the trees, 
under every green tree. Then Rezin, the king of Syria, Pekah, the son of Remaliah, king of Israel, came up to Jerusalem to make war. So you got the ten northern tribes, and then you got Syria making a pact together to go attack the two southern tribes down in Jerusalem. But they besieged Ahaz, but it says in verse 5, but they could not overcome him. At that time, Rezin, the king of Syria, captured a lot for Syria and drove the men of Judah from Elat. Then the Edomites went to Elat and dwelt there to this day. That is until the day, not today, till the day of this writing. Now, Elat is one of my favorite spots in Israel. I just want to segue from all this heavy stuff we've been talking about just for a minute. If you take a tour to Israel and you have a few extra days when the tour is done, do it on your own, fly back at a couple days later, but go down to a lot. It's the seaport down in the Red Sea. And it's just a beautiful, you can swim with dolphins, you can, it's some of the best scuba diving on planet Earth, it's very clear waters. It's just a delightful spot to go. Back in the Old Testament days, it went under the moniker Etzion Geber. Under Solomon's reign, he took and shipped cedars to that port and gold and apes and all sorts of things through that seaport. That became something he controlled. And now uh, th these guys control um, uh, the Edomites, dwell there to this day. Uh, so that's the area. So. Ahaz sent messengers to tiglath Pileser, also known as Pul, the king of Assyria, saying, now get this, here's a king of Judah in Jerusalem who had godly parents and godly grandparents who's turned away from the god Yahweh and says to the Assyrian butcher king, I am your servant and your son. Come and save me from the hand of the king of Syria and from the hand of the king of Israel who will rise up against me. In other words, let me buy your protection. Let me pay you off and I need your help. But what a thing to say to this horrible person in history. I am your servant and your son? Question. Why didn't Ahaz look up to God and say, I am your servant and your son? He could have. And you know what would have happened? God would have rescued him. You say, how do you know that? I know that same way you know it. Because we've read the book of Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 6 and 7, the prophet Isaiah is sent to King Ahaz at this time when these armies are around him. And Isaiah says, hey, don't worry about these trees blowing in the wind. They can't hurt you as long as you ask for God's help. If you turn to the Lord and ask for his help, you have nothing to worry about. And he wouldn't do it. He refused to do it. And so Isaiah said, go ahead, ask God for a sign. And he acted real pious. I'm not going to ask God for a sign. So Isaiah said, well, then God will give you one anyway. And he gave him that beautiful prophecy into the future that a virgin will conceive and bear a son and you will call his name Emmanuel. Speaking of the future deliverance of the nation of Israel. But this king would not see that deliverance. He didn't turn to the Lord. He, he should have said, I am your servant and your son. He didn't do it. He said that to the Assyrian king, tiglath Pileser. And Ahaz took the silver and the gold that was found in the house of the Lord, in the treasuries of the king's house, sent it as a present to the king of Assyria. And the king of Assyria heeded him, for the king of Assyria went up against Damascus, took it, and carried its people captive to Ker and killed Rezin. So the Assyrian superpower takes over Syria, Damascus, swears to protect Judah, so the 10 northern tribes of Israel isn't really a threat. Now look at verse 10. Now King Ahaz, remember he's the southern king, Judah. King Ahaz went to Damascus, travels all the way up north to Syria, to meet Tiglath-Pileser, 
you know, he just bought him off, so he wants to meet the guy. So he meets Tiglath-Pileser, the king of Assyria, and get this, he saw an altar that was at Damascus. And King Ahaz sent to Urijah the priest down in Jerusalem the design of the altar and its pattern according to all its workmanship. Then Urijah the priest built an altar according to all that King Ahaz had sent from Damascus. So Urijah the priest made it before King Ahaz. The priest made it before King Ahaz came from Damascus. So he had it all set up by the time he got back home. When the king came from Damascus, the king saw the altar and the king approached the altar and made offerings on it. So he burned his burnt offerings and grain offerings. Ooh, wait a minute. Wasn't there only one altar? And wasn't that the bronze altar out in that courtyard that Solomon had built so grandiose it was the only place where sacrifices were to be made? He burned his burnt offerings and grain offerings and poured his drink offering and sprinkled the blood of his peace offerings on the altar. He also brought brought the bronze altar, which was before the Lord, from the front of the temple. He moved it from between the new altar and the house of the Lord and put it on the north side of the new altar. So he moved it out of the way, the old original altar, and put his new, cool, pagan altar. Now what's going on here? He saw an altar that probably just looked awesome to him, and he thought, man, that's just cool looking. I like it. I'd like to have something awesome and cool like that, and You know, we have kind of that big, old-fashioned altar. It would just be nice to update the place a little bit, transform it a little bit. And so he moved it out of the way, put this altar that was based upon a pagan design from the Assyrians, but get this, King Ahaz commanded Uriah the priest, saying, on the great new altar on the Morning, burnt offering, the evening grain offering, the king's burnt sacrifice and his grain offering with the burnt offering of his people of the land, their grain offering, their drink offerings, and sprinkle on it all the blood of the burnt offerings, all the blood of the sacrifice, and the bronze altar shall be for me to inquire by. Before the bronze altar was for public use of the priests for all the people of Israel. He moves it to the side, brings in the pagan altar, takes the sacrifices of God on that, uses the bronze altar just for his own personal pleasure to inquire by. Thus thus did Urijah the priest according to all that King Ahaz commanded. And King Ahaz cut off the panels of the carts, removed the lavers from them, And took down the sea from the bronze oxen that were under it and put it on a pavement of stones. In the book of Exodus, chapter 27, and many passages after that, God commands them to construct the bronze altar. Solomon made it a little bit bigger, but God said, look, there's only one place, one place, one place that my sacrifices are to be brought, and it's to be on an altar that is like this. It is to be bronze. Bronze speaks of judgment. I am judging sin on that altar. That sin is covering you guys in the nation of Israel. But this king decided, let's deconstruct God's altar and construct a new altar. And so he takes the bronze altar. Remember, it was on 12 oxen. Remember these, these there, there were three facing one direction, three facing all four directions. It was raised up. He sought to take it off, move out the oxen, probably got rid of them, and just put it down on the, on the pavement. He is deconstructing things around the temple. He cut off the panels of the carts, removed the lavers from them. This was for the washing for the sacrifice of the priests. And removed uh, and took down uh, down the sea from, from the bronze oxen that were on it, put it on a pavement of stones. He also removed the Sabbath pavilion, which they built in the temple, and removed the king's outer entrance from the house of the Lord on account of the king of Assyria. 
Now, there is a movement in the church today called deconstructionism. It's taking articles of faith, beliefs held by Christianity, by believers, looking at them and saying, well, that's what we've been told, but you know, when you become that legalistic and that narrow, that's just toxic Christianity. We need to be more progressive. It's very similar to politics, but it's in Christianity. Progressive politics is dangerous. Progressive Christianity is more dangerous. It sounds good. It's very appealing sounding. Yes, we want to be seen as with it and smart and progressive. Uh, not if that means that you say everything that Jesus said that we believe in to be true and what the Bible says to be true is to be pushed aside and now, instead of toxic Christianity, we should uh, be gender affirming. We shouldn't say that homosexuality is a sin. We shouldn't do that. So, so that is part and parcel of deconstructionism. But maybe he's saying, let's just take the cart and, and, and make it closer to the ground so it's accessible. Right? That makes sense. Just put it lower to the ground, right? It just sounds so humble. But you're removing it from its foundation. And when you remove the foundation, it becomes precarious. When you remove the foundation of the Christian faith, and there are foundational truths that if you don't believe, you are not a Christian. I don't care what church you say you belong to. There are certain fundamentals of the Christian faith that you must believe to go to heaven. You must believe they're foundational. You start messing with those things. Okay, there are certain things you can mess with. You can say, oh, I don't believe that you can speak in tongues. I believe that stopped 2,000 years ago. Okay, we can debate but not divide over that. I don't believe in the rapture of the church like you guys do. Okay, we can debate but not divide over that. If you say, though, Jesus is not God and his blood sacrifice on the cross doesn't take away people's sin, you go on like that and start changing the key doctrines and the moral code of the Bible. That kind of deconstructionism is damnable. You're taking away the foundations. Psalm 11 said, if the foundations are destroyed, what shall the righteous do? He took away the foundation, deconstructed it all, tried to make things simpler, lowered the sea down on the pavement of stones, removed the pavilion in the house of the Lord, etc. Now, the rest of the acts of Ahaz, which he did, are they not written in the chronicles of the kings of Judah? Yes. So Ahaz rested with his fathers. Good. Glad he's gone. And was buried with his fathers in the city of David. Then Hezekiah. Ta-da! Hezekiah. Hezekiah, his son, reigned in his place. Now Hezekiah, we'll get to in chapter 18. He's a rose between two thorns. He's sandwiched between Ahaz, his dad, and Manasseh, his son. You think Ahaz was bad. Manasseh's worse. Manasseh's worse. But in between these two men, there's a rose. His name is Hezekiah. He was a wonderful king, and we'll get to him next time. For more resources from Calvary Church in Skip Heitzig, visit calvarynm.church. Thank you for joining us from this teaching in our series, Expound.